is totally irresponsible parenting. Not according to the internet. Where on the internet? Dax, it's time for your bath. But I miss my show. Don't argue with me, young man. Just do it. This is our dad. I'm the professor. Yeah, he made us in his laboratory by accident. Don't worry, professor. I was an accident, too. <laughs> You're my children, and I love you, but you're all terrible. Make some noise for Mr. Dominic Money! <laughs> based on that, that's a beautiful thing, right? Yeah, man, you got to follow your passions, you know, because if you follow your passions, then it never really feels like you work, because you would do it for free. Anyway, I always wanted to act, and, you know, I would, I would do it for free, don't tell my agent. But, <laughs> uh, I would do it for free, I love doing it. Um, and it's the same with animals. I, I keep animals, I keep a whole bunch of different animals, I, you know, I tend a pretty interesting garden, and I sat down one time with a producer, and he 
made different types of shows and said, what do you want to do? And I said, look, I have all these ideas for animals that I want to go see around the world and hopefully change the ideas of people who are scared of classic kind of nightmare animals like sharks and spiders and snakes and bees and wasps and stuff like that. My vibe is, if you're an animal lover, if you claim to be an animal lover, it's not a selective group. You know, you don't say, I'm an animal lover, so that means I love dogs and cats and horses and donkeys and rabbits and things like that. If you're an animal lover, you have to love leeches and snails and slugs and spiders. That's how you go, right? Yeah, you know? Otherwise, don't wear the bags, don't wear the flag. So, yeah, that's, that's what I'm passionate about. I love that. I love that. Do you have, I know this is a crazy question, do you have an animal that really kind of sets things off for you to go, this is my passion? Um, well, I mean, insects are probably my thing, just because if you like animals and you want access to... It's true, right? <laughs> um, if you like animals and you want access to animals as much as possible, insects live Everybody. in your garden, of course. they live in your bathroom, they live in your carpet, they live on your eyelashes, sorry to tell you guys. Yeah, uh, yeah there are certain animals. Yeah, yeah, no, you're collecting them. Certain yeah, yeah. animals that live in our eyelashes. Uh, and, you know, they don't cause any harm, they're actually good for the health of your eyes and stuff like that. So, I don't know, I, I just felt like if I, you know, because I'm obsessed with all animals, but I was like, if I want to be around them all the time, then I'm going to lean into invertebrates. So, reptiles and insects are kind of my jam, but don't get me wrong, I love horses and dogs and birds. Of course, of course. You know, whales and polar bears and stuff. <laughs> I'm just giving this lady every now and then. Here's the best, polar bears and sloth bears and blue whales and sharks. <laughs> so go back to, the, to your acting though, okay, so once you realize that this is a pathway that you can follow, right, um, there's many different ways for you to go. You can do voices, you can do theater, you can do uh, TV, movies. What drove you to your first audition? Was it just opportunity or did you know? Um, yeah, I mean, well the reason why I became an actor was Star Wars, but obviously I didn't think, uh, you know, wow, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be an actor and immediately get involved in like space opera stuff like that, you know, I, I, um, I loved Star Wars, I still continue to love Star Wars, and, and then when I realized, yeah, it's Star Wars comes um, <laughs> when I realized that, that Han Solo was also Indiana Jones, I couldn't figure that out, right? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, seven or eight, I was like, how come he can, like, wear a whip and a whip, and he's a different person, and he has a blaster, and he's in space, and my dad's like, well, he's an actor, he wears different clothes, and he's in different films. And I was like, oh, like that light bulb thing went on. <laughs> so then I thought, okay, uh, I'd like to do that. And I was probably, I don't know, I don't know, seven, eight, I don't know, something like that. And then it got serious at school. I kind of dog it, and my teachers told my parents that I like really dog it and wanted to do it more. And was pretty adamant about doing more and more plays. And then I played football a lot as a kid and I got injured one summer so I couldn't play football and then I, I joined two youth theatres and again, it was, you know, I was kind of cocky when I was younger and I like forced them to like do this play and give me this part which I never do nowadays, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> you wouldn't have to now. Yeah, I know, but it's a pretty heavy swing as like a 12 year old to be like, you should do this play but I should play this part, you know, that's what I did. kind of gnarly to think about it. And then like, this is pre-internet so this is kind of aging me but um, I did this play at the Manchester Youth Theatre, which is like the second biggest youth theatre in the country outside of the National Youth Theatre. And I went to my local library and I had all of the agents in the north of England's address printed down. I just had it printed down on the notes. <laughs> and then I borrowed a typewriter from my school and I wrote you know, this letter out like 20 or 30 times. Dear sir, old man, my name is Dominic. I am doing this play on these dates. Please come and see me. <laughs> and um, and uh, I mean, I don't know, but like, I think like three of them came. Yeah, which is not a lot, out of, you know, out of like 20 or 30. And then two of them offered to represent me, and I went with one. And then I had one audition for a soap opera in England called Emmerdale Farm, which I didn't get, and I was like, Devastated by it. <laughs> um, and then the second audition I got, and then, you know, that was it. I started working for the BBC, worked for the BBC for like four years, and, you know, I haven't really stopped working since then, which has been. Okay, amazing. come on now. When you're 12 and you're telling people that you should do this play and you have that outcome, I think you were right. I don't think that you were right. <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. 
there's a sincere amount of dedication that you showed with that. And that's not even just the craft work, that's actual behind the scenes ingenuity, really. So, yeah, yeah, I also got really lucky. I think you're really lucky if you know what you want to do at a young age, you know, because then you, you make all those mistakes when you're a kid, right? And you figure out what you should or shouldn't be doing as a kid. So, by the time you get to 16, 17, 18, when things are starting to get serious, you know, you've, you've been in the trenches for four or five years figuring it out. I was making the big mistakes that you make as an actor when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, on stage at my school, you know, <coughs> not, not speaking with clarity, forgetting my lines, jumping into other people's work, doing their performance instead of mine, you know, <laughs> trying to overshadow people, making all those terrible mistakes that you make as an actor. So that by the time, I was actually working on the TV when I was 18. There was a little bit of owning of what I, you know, should or shouldn't be doing, which I needed because I then ended up working with a fantastic actress called Patricia Routledge in a, in a, yeah, in a TV show called um, Hetty Wake Up Investigates. Very, very catchy title for a TV show. And, um, you know, she was amazing and a great teacher, but she was extremely strict, extremely strict like a matron. Don't do that. Don't do that. And I'm like, oh. And I think she would have done it like 20 times more if I hadn't have started to work out some of those things that I shouldn't do. It's amazing. I love that. Zach, see? Yeah. Get on, get on. I agree. I love that. Now, moving into international film, um, was that a different process from you know being a little bit more homegrown? Did the uh, acts of Hollywood did it change anything for you? Or were you like, oh no, this is, this is still just acting? No, not really. It's, it's all kind of the same. I would approach it the same. I mean, it might be a little bit more exciting, you know, if you go from doing like a BBC One show, which was extremely exciting, yeah. to then doing some English films, right? But then, yeah, starting to do a film and think, oh, this is going to get seen in the United States, this is going to get seen in whatever, Australia or Rio de Janeiro or whatever. Yeah, that's kind of exciting, but I don't, I don't approach my work any, any differently. It's right. still. Learn your lines, hit your marks, do your research, know what you're doing, you know, go to bed early, eat right, go to the gym. Um, you know, you have to take care of yourself. It's long hours, you know, an average good day when you're working with the scene, I'm usually getting picked up somewhere around about 5.30, usually getting home around about 7, 7.30, you eat your dinner, I pull my dial out for the next day, make sure I know what I'm doing, fall asleep by 9.30 or 10, and then you just repeat, and then at the weekend, you know, you just like, Go to the gym, make sure you're eating well, make sure that you're not getting sick. Because the other thing is, it doesn't matter if you get sick. That was one of the cruel things that I learned when I was younger. If you're sick, they're like, okay, we're still picking up at 5 30. You know, like, we'll, we'll give you hot lemon and honey and ginger in between takes, and you can lie down, but you still have to know your lines and you still have to act like you're not sick. So you can't be kind of talking like that and see the snotty nose. You have to like figure out where it's for us, not seem like you have a sinus infection. So you have to be well most of the time. What a boot camp. What a yeah, boot camp. Yeah, it's a win. No, no, that's brilliant though. Um, okay, so in terms of some of the many wonderful, you know, talents that you've co-starred with, do you have any you know, particular favorites that you really enjoyed the experience? We just talked about someone who was very strict. But did you have others that you were just like, this is fun and I love it? Well, I mean, Billy's the best. Just in terms of like, you know, I've, I have a couple of people in my life who can read my mind and I can read theirs, you know, that kind of like, they can finish my sentences, we're just vibing on each other, we know what's going on, it's all love, there's all good intentions, but you know, sometimes you have to kind of oh, explain, oh, I meant this with the joke, or oh, I was going in this direction, I never have to do that with Billy, he just knows, he just gets it, he's a great actor, he's a great human, um, you know, uh, I was a big fan. My favorite film ever is Apocalypse Now, so I got a chance to work with Martin Sheen yes. when I was younger, which was extraordinary. And you know, we were able to talk about that film. And um, Max von Sydow was in that film, who's you know one of the great European actors. Um, Hugh Jackman was really fun to work with. And really <laughs> amazing to watch him work in at close distance because you know he was obviously the lead in Wolverine, and he had a crazy responsibility on that film because he was also one of the producers and he was hosting the Oscars at the time, mm -hmm. so he was rehearsing, so we were in Sydney, we would finish on a Friday, he would jump on a plane, and fly to LA, rehearse on the Saturday, Sunday, then fly Sunday night back wow. to set, then come to set Monday morning, and he was exhausted, he was always in a great mood, and he was always chipper, 
and he looked like a dreamboat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good, that would be too. Come well, on. come on, I'm stood next to Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman, and everyone looks like an onion. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary physical specimens. I mean, Ryan Reynolds, he's a beast, you know, and look next to Hugh Jackman, he looked small. He's like, <laughs> I genuinely did. And, Jack was like doing press ups before the take in like a, a you know a vest type thing, and he'd stand up and they'd put the clapboard on and I'd be stood next to him. And I'd like look over and he had like these veins just like popping out of his shoulders. I was like, I've never seen that type of muscle. Like, like, I've seen the shoulder muscle with like a delta, but I've not seen it like split in like three parts. Like, it was just an absolute weapon. So he was an inspiration. Um, yeah, no, that's that was a standout. I mean, look, don't get me wrong, Lord of the Rings is amazing, and, and that cast is incredible, and obviously Elijah and Sean and, and Billy are all my brothers, and we spend a lot of time with each other, and, and they're beautiful people. So crazy alchemy with Billy and Alex. Of course, there was something going on. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? It's a new shot. Yeah. It's a new shot. Um, okay, obviously, we should talk about Lord of the Rings just a little bit. Um, that was a huge undertaking. When it came out, it was monumental, changed the game. Did you guys have any idea of what scale this was going to be when you got hired on? Yeah, I think we knew a little bit about the scale. I mean, I, I landed with John Reese Davis. We were on the same flight, and um, uh, you know, I thought that we were going to get maybe two days or so to get over this crazy crushing jet lag, which right. I've never had to that degree before. You know, um, Manchester to London is an hour. London to LA is twelve hours. LA to Auckland is twelve hours, and then Auckland to Wellington is an hour. So you come off that flight, and you're like, what? <laughs> you literally lost like three days. Yeah, it's hectic. And we we went to the hotel, and then we got a phone call saying we're going to pick up in an hour, and I was tripping, you know, just like, <laughs> like, down. And we went, and we saw Pete, and uh, Pete was like, "Do you want to see Bag End?" And I was like, "Yeah, of course I want to see Bag End." I mean, you know, I know these books, I know this mythology, so. We went and saw Bag End, complete with like scarves on, on coat hangers and half written maps and pipes and all this kind of stuff. And it was extraordinary and brilliant, and the attention to detail was overwhelming. And then Pete said, Do you want to see Gandalf's Bag End? And I was like, uh, Okay, uh, I didn't know what that meant, you know. I'm just kind of following around the corner, and now we see this absolutely perfect version of Bag End, complete with the scarves and the maps and the pipes. and the rugs on the floor, but everything's smaller, so <laughs> the beam can come in and seem so much bigger. And John, he stayed and Pete were kind of walking through this thing, and John's like, oh, and uh, I was just like, I was just speechless, I was just stunned, you know, just like, wow, I've, I've never seen one of these sets like this, let alone two sets right. that are identical. And um, I think at that point, I was like, oh, this is the biggest thing that I've ever worked on, and will always be the biggest thing that I any of us would ever work on it. It became this mm -hmm. pop culture. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's like, you know, they talk about catching lightning in a bottle type thing with those movies. It just, it caught fire in a way that, of course it's a great film, objectively they're great films, but catching fire like that and, and, and you know, like things like, you know, Mordor and the Ring and Gollum and My Precious kind of moving into pop culture. That was that was really interesting. Wow, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I love that you said that you were very familiar with the content. Um, like, how much of a super Tolkien reader were you? Like, super immersed? Like, you read The Hobbit and everything, or you knew Lord of the Rings though? Um, yeah, I mean, my dad obviously child of the '60s in England growing up, so Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit a big deal. And um, we lived in Germany when I was a kid. And we would come back probably twice a year, drive from Germany to the kind of uh, port, the shipping port, and then take a boat over to the south of England, and then drive up to the north of England. So that's like a 12 hour drive type thing. And we would listen to the Hobbit story tapes on the way there to keep us quiet. And then as we got a little bit older, we would listen to the beautiful Ian Holmes version of the BBC version of The nice. Lord of the Rings, which is, again, extraordinary. Yeah, and, yeah, amazing. And, um, I remember saying to my dad when I was a kid, when I was like 11, 12, 13, should I read these books? And my dad was like, well, you absolutely should read these books. Of course. But you might not be ready yet. And I think my dad didn't want me to start and then get dissuaded. He wanted me to read it and, and go all the way through with it. And, you know, as you guys all know, Lord of is like this. You know, it's over a thousand pages. It's intimidating. So when I did read it, I, I just couldn't believe how 
well it was written and you know the work of a, of a true minister and I've, I don't think well I, I certainly have never felt so immersed in a world before do you know what I mean like, yeah. I, I couldn't believe how well Tolkien was able to capture the Shire or capture Rivendell or Loch Lorien or Edoras or any of these places and the characters were great and you know in a slightly bittersweet way of thinking about it now Mary's so much cooler in the books. <laughs> it's true, man. Mary's the guy who tells Gandalf the code to open the door in Moria. It's not Frodo. It's Frodo in the films. They do me dirty. <laughs> Mary, Mary is the true warrior hobbit out of the four of them. You know, obviously, obviously Pippin, you know, does a lot through the war, but he's not on the battlefield stabbing the Witch King and, mm -hmm. you know, almost burning his, his arm off and permanently damaging his arm. And, you know, Mary has a lot to do and, and he's just a little bit more prominent in the books. So I do, um, I do hold those books in, in high regard and, you know, I like Mary, he's kind of, he's kind of cool. <laughs> we like it. We like it. Yeah. Now, I know that there's some fans here that want to ask some questions, and I know we've got at least one microphone over there. I think there's one on this side. So I want to open that up for everybody if that's cool with you. Yo, let's do it. Awesome. We'll start on this side. Hello, friend. Oh, Mike's not on there. Well, when we go here, yeah, yeah, we'll see. Fix this one. Let's have a good back. Try it. Hello? Hey, yeah! We'll come back to you. We'll come back to you. Thanks, man. Great question. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Gandalf. Hello. Um, 
to love you, Lord of the Rings, but I got to say one of my favorite characters for sure is Charlie Lost. Right. Um, so t talk to us a little bit about, you know, going from, you know, film to TV and the development lead through that whole that whole series. I mean, from being a junkie to not coming to both. That's right. so huge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it's getting emotional right here. Yeah, it was a wild ride, you know. I, I met JJ, it was like three days before the Oscars when Return of the King kind of did that clean, sweet thing. And, uh, yeah, I met JJ. And, um, if you, actually, if you look at my nails when I'm at the Oscars, I've got the my nail beds painted black because I thought it looked kind of rad. I call it like a reverse <laughs> French nail polish. <laughs> and when I, I met JJ like two days before the Oscars and he saw my nails and he was like, keep those, we'll use those in Lost. And we actually do use those in Lost. Yeah. And that was just me, just for the Oscars. I was like, oh, I want to get something cool going on with my nails. So life was imitating art very much. At the time, I was probably playing my life pretty fast and loose, certainly faster and looser. So I was probably a little bit more kind of, you know, staying up late and, um, you know, being probably a little bit more of a, of a rock star of sorts. So they probably <laughs> saw that a little bit. When I first met JJ for the last, there was no Charlie. You know, they wanted me initially to read for Sawyer because all the men were reading for Sawyer. Wow. Yeah, it's like a generic thing. They have a male role, they have a female role. And, you know, when we, when I finished meeting JJ, I was like, do you want me to read the scene? JJ's like, nah, well, when, there's no way that we're going to have you play Sawyer. <laughs> create a different role. And I was like, okay. And I came like two weeks later. And they created Charlie. He was my age, he looked like me, he acted like me. <laughs> and we did the screen test. Normally at screen test it's two actors, so there was two Jacks, two Kates. Colby Smolders was testing for oh. yes. oh, the uh, Two Boons, two Hurleys, two Sawyers. There's only one Charlie, it was me. Oh. Yeah, I saw JJ walking yeah, I saw JJ walking down the corridor and I was like, there's only one Charlie? And he went, yeah man, don't fuck it up. <laughs> Yeah, and then we talked about Oasis, we talked about the Star Roses, we talked about the Verve, we talked about the Cure a little bit, we talked about these type of bands that are a little kind of maudlin and maybe a little bit kind of like swag and you're cool and maybe they've had their problems with substances and stuff like that. And then we, you know, between JJ and Damon and, and the writers and stuff, we started to fashion this idea of like, what if this guy had the briefest glimpse of fame? You know, and how frustrating that must be to have had a hit, to have a single, to, to, to be on the cusp of a career and it's been snatched away from him. He's a frustrated artist. So we did that and, you know, obviously his, uh, his struggles with uh, drugs and stuff are, are well known in the show. I was, I was essentially trying to play him as a bad, good guy. So I knew that he was good, but I was constantly trying to push the bad. Anytime you see Charlie in a hood, anytime you see him in his hood up, that's bad, Charlie. It's off to some shenanigans, you know. You, usually heroin or something you know, dodgy with, you know, the, the rest of the crew. And then, as we got into season three, I kind of expressed a few kind of concerns about just being the guy holding the baby. Right. Claire's off having adventures. Jack and Sawyer and, and Locke and Kate and Hurley are all off having adventures, and I'm just on the beach holding the baby, which is beautiful. I love kids, don't get me wrong. But I was like, yeah, come on, this was supposed to be like, Charlie had some stories too. So David then said to me, I think we found a way to write for you, write a great storyline for you, but it means that you're gonna leave at the end of season three. And I was like, great, this is gonna be my best crack of the whip that I'm gonna get. Mm -hmm. You know, other members of the cast, they might kill four of them in one episode or something like yeah. that. So I was like, okay, let's do it. I'll take it. And we started to preempt this, you know, you're gonna die, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> And kept coming and kept coming and then you know we, we filmed the sequence for the for the end i love water water's always been like really kind and nice to me you know i scuba dive i surf all this kind of stuff so i felt very nurtured and took care of in the water which allowed me to be vulnerable and, and do that scene and um it's consistently talked about as being you know one of the saddest deaths in tv and i'm mm -hmm. super proud of it and uh, i think it was a great show yeah, yeah. Our hearts, man. Mm -hmm. it is, it is Hello, how are you going? So clearly you have a lot of connection to the characters you play. Um, most of us are here for Lord of the Rings, so I'm going to ask a very themed question. What's the moment you felt yourself connect most with Mary? Like you're like, that's my boy. This is me, I'm playing Mary, this is, this is Mary. <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, it's obviously in the fellowship, and I think one of the abiding uh, kind of positive aspects of Mary's personality is he's really there for his guys, you know. His guys, obviously, have been Frodo and Sam. They're his cousins, they're his family, they're his bros. He's there for them. He wants them to have a good time, he wants them to be taken care of. Clearly, he wants them to be safe. When it gets to a point where things are actually physically dangerous for them, it's concerning for Mary. But ultimately, I think Mary kind of looks around and he's like, if these guys have, you know, a flag and a veil and, and some nice food to eat and everyone's happy and smiling, I'm in my element. And there's a few moments in fellowship, you know, before it gets really hectic where you can just see Mary being like, great, these guys are okay, you know, we, we're safe, we're at the Prince and Pony, we got here, we're out of the rain, it's warm, you know, we're having a, a pint, and, uh, <laughs> and that's, that's a great thing. And I think, again, because I always, I have a tattoo that says, like, life imitates art, you know, which I, which I believe it does. I felt the same way on set, you know, I just felt that kind of protective thing about specifically Elijah, Sean, and Billy. We were together a lot, certainly for the first film. Elijah was exhausted, he had a lot to do, there was a lot of pressure. You know, Sean did not physically feel great. He's, you know, he had to be a lot bigger than he was comfortable with. And, you know, Billy and I were reading each other's minds at that point. So I, I just felt like, <laughs> as long as everyone's having a good day, I would look around and be like, are you good, are you good, are you good? Okay, I'm good. And that kind of felt like a crossover between Dom and Mary. So that's what it kind of locked in for me. That's awesome. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Hello. 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 So um, another Mary-themed question, um, just sort of going off you saying Mary is cooler in the books, and let me also say, you know, like Justice for Fatty Bolger, where was he? Um, but are there any specific scenes from the books that you would have wanted to act out as Mary but didn't get the chance to? Mm. Yeah, there was a few sequences that it made sense that uh, Pete decided to not have them, but you know, there's. Um, there's a sequence with, with the Barrowdowns where, you know, obviously the Hobbits find themselves in, in harm's way, which would, would obviously have been a really great thing. The character of Tom Bombadil is not included in mm -hmm. the films. Oh. It kind of makes sense. I mean, look, when, when the Hobbits end up with Tom Bombadil, they're there for a long time, right. months and months past, where they're in safety. And you just, you simply can't do that in a film. You need things to keep moving. Otherwise, as an audience member, you just go, well, they're fine, they're just, you know, picking days and eating cheese and thinking, hey, why are we watching this? It's nice. <laughs> we need them to be in peril. So I understood why Tom Bombadil was not included, but he is a fascinating character. The of course. He's like, look, you know, walls come and go, and I, you know, I'm here, and the forest is safe, and I'm cool. Is it a little bit like Tree Bird in that regard? I think if you, someone had asked me who would take, who play Tom Bombadil if he was included, and I was like, Mark Rylance would be an amazing mm -hmm. Tom Bombadil, you know. He has that kind of like whimsy yeah. to him, you know, slightly absent-minded type of vibe. Um, so that, and then obviously we've talked about it ad nauseum, but like the Scarab of the Shire would be legitimately epic. You know, mm -hmm. you've got Mary and Pippin coming back, having learned what it means to be in a war and, you know, organize things, and they start to organize things, and Frodo and Sam pick up the speed with them, and they, you know, rouse Saruman and his bad guys out of the Shire and clean it up, you know, and unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but the way that they dealt with Saruman in the film was completely different, so mm -hmm. it's difficult to see that. You do see Mary Pippin, Frodo and Sam kind of coming back into the Shire in their warrior regalia, so it's a little nod towards it, but of course that would have been a great thing to see. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. 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 Hi. You didn't pull the mic down if it's too yeah, hard. Yeah. Oh yeah, so um, my question is, um, I'm sure that you and the other Hobbit actors can attest to, Denver is a pretty crazy high energy city, I mean you've seen it at the convention, I was wondering, um, what do you have any like, any crazy or memorable, like, or just like, one anecdote about like, being in Denver in general? <laughs> um, well I mean, it's weird when you come to these places when you're working because you don't tend to see them as much as you would like, you know. We did go for dinner the first night. I've been, I mean, the guys are okay with it, but I, I was pretty adamant that, like, we should go for dinner every Friday night because we're going to be working all day Saturday, all day Sunday. You know, Elijah leaves tonight, Billy and Sean leave tomorrow morning, so, you know, you don't get that many opportunities to go for dinner. Of course, we're tired, we've been traveling, but, you know, 
it's important. So we've had some great dinners thus far. We went to a place called Three Saints Revival on Friday night. And, you know, we basically just said to this uh, waitress who came over called Mandy, um, we were like, you just bring us stuff, just bring us food, you know, we'll eat it. Just bring us whatever's good out of the kitchen. So she started like bringing stuff. And, you know, it became kind of a bit of a, a hot tea feast. <laughs> Sean really wanted to ride a scooter back. Oh <laughs> so he, uh, he couldn't find a free scooter and he was not happy that he had to walk for like half an hour. So, but I was taking pictures of us all on the way back. <laughs> you know, those are the precious moments. We all live in California, you know, we all live in LA and we make big plans to see each other, but you know, people have families and people have responsibilities and it doesn't work out as much as we want. So I just kind of said, look, every Friday night that we land, we have to go for dinner. So after this, we go to Chicago next weekend, then we go to Boston and Toronto, and we figured out dinner at all of these places. So yeah, nice. those are the original. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if, you, if you compare your friendships with them um, to the Ninja Turtles, <laughs> which turtle is each of you? Yeah, I'm not as well versed on the, on the Ninja Turtles as like Sean obviously played in Ninja Turtles. He did, he did. Um, well, well I'll go, you guys can tell me. I mean, who's the who's the organizer of Ninja Turtles? Who's, who's well, you got the leader. Leo. Right? Leonardo's Leonardo's the leader. So that's so that would probably be Elijah, just because he is the de facto leader of okay. Elijah. You know, we all release tension on the rope here and there, but I think all in all, if Elijah says no, no, we're going there for dinner, we're like, oh, we can't bring that. And then we do anyway. You know? So okay, so that's Elijah. So that's that's okay. So yeah, Donatello is who's the geeky one. Uh, okay, go on. Who's the... We've got Raphael, who's the attitudinal one. And then there we have Michelangelo, the party animal. So I'm probably Michelangelo. <laughs> 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 and, and then Billy and Sean would be, what do you know? You yeah, Donatello and Raphael, or yeah, Donatello and Raphael. Raphael yeah. Left. So Donatello is the geeky brain one, and then Raphael is the more attitudinal, I'll kick you kind of guy. So probably Sean Astin is the I'll kick you guy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's me. All right, I was just curious about that. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Don. Thanks for uh, hey. scheduling. Uh, my question is, what was your most favorite and your least favorite part in filming Lord of the Rings? Um, well, most favorite is the friends you make, because I think that's the thing that we go through in life. That's the things that you take ultimately, right? I mean, the memories that you make, and it's usually with all the humans, you know? So, certainly on rings, it's the, it's the friendships that you make, because they're tied up in your memories. So these relationships moving forward with the fellowship and with certain crew members and you know obviously with Pete and, and his family and stuff like that and then what was, was it the worst was it the hardest thing the toughest yeah. thing uh, the worst part the worst part I had a really great time on those movies the worst part um I don't know we had one day off a week you know so you, you used to like two days off a week normally right so one day off a week we worked Saturday and then we would usually go out for dinner Saturday night, and then you wake up Sunday, and you have to do the laundry, and you have to pull your week's work and see what you've got, and then you have to tidy your house because it's an uh, absolute mess because you've just been sleeping in it and letting it go to ruin all week. And just the, just the free time was, was so short, you know, and then boom, you get picked up at 5.15 on a Monday morning. So I think probably just the lack of any free time was, was, was the most challenging, but I, I love that job. It was super. Great question. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for nice yeah. Appreciate it. I uh, wanted to go back to uh, a little bit of the lost piece. When you were in Lord of the Rings, it became this huge global phenomenon, and then you almost immediately went to Lost, which was a, a phenomenon on its own. Was that kind of jarring to go from phenomenon to phenomenon, or was it kind of like, this is just life now for me to going forward? I'm just part of these huge projects. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how connected I am to that stuff. How much value there is for me to be personally connected to that stuff when things get big, when things get gnarly, you know? Like, of course, I was aware of it. I was aware that, like, going out had suddenly got, like, a little bit more complicated than normal. I was not able to go to, like, bars or restaurants or, you know, wherever in the same way. You know, if, you, if you're going to, like, airports or hotels, you're going to expect to, like, be in those situations a little bit, but then it kind of got a bit weird, people outside their house and stuff like that, so, oh, nope. yeah, um, 
But I think for me personally, it's just important to not be connected to that. That's kind of an ego piece, you know. Oh, now I'm famous. Oh, now I'm not as famous. Who gives a shit? You know, do you? <laughs> I'm an actor. It's just what I do. It's like a byproduct, you know. It's like you drive a car, exhaust comes out the back. So it's like I'm an actor, and then the fumes of that is sometimes you're famous, sometimes you're less famous, sometimes you're more. So I don't, you know, it, it's it is normal for me, you know. I've been quote unquote. It, uh, experiencing some level of fame since I was 18, you know, so, you know, way more than half of my life I've, I've been in a place of people being like, hey, and I go, oh, hey, how's it going? And then I just keep going, you know? so, I think, it's, I think it's weirder for my family, I think it was weirder for my mom and dad, they're used to it now, I think it was weirder for my brother, he's a little bit more used to it now. Sometimes my, you know, extraneous friends or family that are not used to it at all, they get freaked out by it, but I don't, I mean, you know, I I can immediately see in a room if someone's going to come over to me. I can tell in a restaurant if someone's biding their time or if someone's going to take a picture. And, you know, I have family and friends be like, oh, someone's a rare. Oh, I recognize you. Like, yeah, yeah, I saw that like 25 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, um, so, yeah, it, it, no, it's not, it's not weird. It's just life, you know, and it's, I think it's important to not be connected to that. And some of the actors that, I've known over the years that do seem a little fixated on like, I gotta do this, I gotta get big again, I gotta have this moment again, or I'm not quite as big as I used to be. You, you're in trouble at that point, do you know what I mean? Concentrate on your craft. If, it's, if it catches fire, great. If it doesn't, but you did the same job and you have the same integrity, then you're gonna be okay. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, man. Good question. I think having that balance is one of the reasons why we love you so much, because you are still something like approachable in spite of all the things. So we appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Hello, friend. Hi there. Hey, so um, I'm a student studying biochemistry with a focus on environmentalism and conservation. And I want to say I really appreciate how you use your platform to promote um, environmentalism and conservation and your love for animals. Um, and I also wanted to just ask you, during the pandemic, I know that you did this live um, every week, and it was a huge source of comfort for me in my life, and I really appreciated how you spread love and kindness and mental health awareness during that time. Um, but I wanted to ask, did this at all influence you um, getting started in podcasting with Billy and starting the friendship on the internet? Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think I had been talking to Billy about doing a podcast for a couple of years, and, and you know, Billy just was not as well versed on, on podcasts as I was, so it took a while for him to get there. But I, you know, I started to kind of say to him, you know, it's just the two of us just sat around for an hour, just having a conversation. Doesn't really matter where it goes, and we'll have fun with it, and, and it, it'll be great. And very quickly, you know, Billy picked it up. But this thing, which is the Dumb Isolation Show, which I did during COVID, so was good. was really fun for me. But you know, honestly, it was it was helpful for me too. You know, I live on my own. A bunch of animals around me I have some responsibilities with those animals but you know as I'm sure we all experienced during COVID those days got long yeah you, know, you weren't working you were up at five in the morning sometimes and you're like man I'm not tired I'm not going to be tired until 10 o'clock at night I need to fill my day with a little bit of structure so you know the structure of meditation and breakfast and making tea or coffee was huge and then by the time it got to like 10 or 11 I was like okay what do I do now what are my targets what are my goals and I just kind of thought well, if I can talk about what's been helping me, that whatever, I watched this film and it was great, or I got into Lego, or I listened to this album and it was really fun, it will be me reaching out into this great void and seeing if anyone else was like, you know, having the same experience that, that I'm having. So it was a great source of comfort for me too. I think maybe it proved a little, um, kind, of, kind of proof of concept thing to the podcast guys to be able to say, oh, well, if we add Billy into that this thing, which I did a couple of times, mm -hmm. uh, then we can see what the what the podcast is, you know. So yeah, it was a it was a really fun thing. Hopefully, everyone out there listens yes. to the friendship funny. Woo! Yeah, okay. I say it because it's Shane's Shane's plug here, and I say it every so often, but like, you know, this is a strange industry in which it needs to be constantly growing, mm -hmm. and as soon as you plateau. Then the company that you work with is like, eh, well, you, you, you were doing this and now you're kind of doing this, and we get to a point where we just can't do it anymore. So it has, the beast has to be fed, yeah. right? <laughs> which is a cynical thing, but we have to consistently get more and more subscribers. So 
if you guys love the podcast and you want us to keep doing it, the way for us to keep doing it is to just consistently get more and more subscribers. So you guys can do it for us. Yes, exactly. So uh, thank you for that. Great question. What's, what's, it, what's it called, the last plug? It's called The French Pony, which is the t-shirt that I'm wearing right now. Even if you don't listen to the podcast, just go subscribe to it. <laughs> so unfortunately, I've been given a cue that we've run out of time. Oh. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. Mm. Unless you want to try the speed round. Yeah, the speed round. Speed round, speed round. How many more people do we have? I can see one, two, three, four. How many do we have over there? Five over there? Come on, let's speed. That's like nine people. You got it? Let's do it. Come on, I'll try it. I'll answer it as fast as I can. All right. Are we going to miss it? We're going to miss it. Go. Any possibility of a drive shaft for you into Okay, the uh, PlayStation 2, uh, back in uh, the World of the Rings 2000, I'm sure the game had uh, Easter eggs where you guys talk shit about each other, and it's a better game, right? And even though it's a better game, it's Well, uh, Elijah now has two very young children, you know, like a little, little baby and like a toddler, so Elijah doesn't play games that much anymore, so I think his gaming skills have fallen off. Billy really puts in a great effort, he's not an actual gamer, I'm going to say out of three of us, I'm probably the best game. <laughs> <laughs> you actually have a game too, so yes. You have a game too. Hello. Oh, he actually broke his foot during that kick and everything. Right. Is there any fun facts or behind the scenes things that you wish would have that level of thing? Oh. <laughs> I think, you know, the grub that, that Mary Pippin drank when we were like passed out and the Oroka, like, like Finn's grub and stuff? That, I believe, was um, prune juice and some sort of fizzy soda that was made to go flat. So it was like heavily sugar. Like, oh. so That's not that bad. Do you uh, have any interactions with any of the animators or special effects um, artists during the creation of Lord of the Rings? Um, I mean, obviously, we were in and out of Weta Digital, and they would show us these incre uh, incredible programs like Massive, which was developed by Weta, you know, crowd stuff. So we saw that in its infancy, and then obviously watched it with Helm Steve and watched it with the writer of the Rohirrim and stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, when we go to New Zealand, Usually we'll go in and out of Wetter Physical and Wetter Digital once or twice, and they'll generally show us like, woohoo, check it out, this is what we're doing now. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Considering your Friendship Onion podcast, have you, Elijah, Sean, and Billy ever considered doing a D&D &D campaign? Woo! And Woo! Doing it live? Yes! Yeah, I mean, we, we, did, we did pitch that to those guys. Obviously, they don't have us. You know, we're getting the four of us together is difficult outside of these conventions and stuff. In, initially, you know, years ago, I had said to Elijah, we're going to do a podcast together, and Elijah's like, ah, I'm not sure if I'm kind of going to jump into the podcast world. And then from there, obviously, you know, it, it became something that Billy was into. The only reason why I asked Elijah first was because Elijah listened to podcasts, Billy really didn't, and then, you know, Billy started to do it. But I think we'll always have Billy, uh, sorry, Elijah and Sean coming back with an open invitation, maybe we'll do some sort of Christmassy thing. The other thing is, like, a lot of, a lot of times people online are like, why have you not invited Orlando? Why have you not invited Liv? Or Vic? We've invited all of them. <laughs> <laughs> they all have an open invitation. So it's not as if we've selected and said we don't want these people. Everyone has been invited. Lots of people are busy. Lots of people don't want to do it. That's fine. It's up to them. But they've all been invited. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hi, Dan. I'm Sam. What was your take on the meaning of the ending of Lost? Ooh. Uh, this was supposed to be quick. <laughs> Right, I, I, I stopped watching the last half of three season two, so I'm the wrong person to ask. You've got to ask JJ and yeah. Kevin Lindelof. I mean, you can't ask me, he's dead at the time. Yeah, he writes it. That's like asking uh, Huckleberry Finn, you know, what does uh, Mark Twain's work mean? Like, he's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> last one. Good, good, good. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah? There's no one there? Yeah, yeah we got it. Oh, there is someone there. We got someone there. So, I was I play a little guitar and a little piano, I'm not very well. Billy's a much better piano player, uh, sorry, guitar player than me. You know, my favorite band is probably the Beatles, I have two Beatles tattoos. Woo! Anyway, I'm a big fan of the Stone Roses, probably I'm a big fan of the 1975, I think they're fantastic. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I like to do Shadow, I like the Wu-Tang Clan, I like the Sonics. And uh, they're like, oh, Coast Contra, who are excellent. Um, yeah, 
It was the best of that. Check out the 1975. We really love it. There you go. That's the nice one. Hi, I'm wearing your purple nice shirt. Merch, merch, merch. Merch, merch, merch. <laughs> and I have two questions. Oh, okay. two questions. Mm -hmm. What's it going to take to get Brad Dourif on the Friendship Onion to do it. a Seat of Chucky reunion? Uh, and will you take Billy on a Wild Things tour? Ooh. Okay, well, um, Brad, Brad Dourif has been invited. We'd love to have him. The last time I saw him was in Telford. He said he'd come on. Obviously, we have to work out his schedule. We'll see the next time we're all in California together. <coughs> Excuse me. Billy was on an episode of Wild Things. I don't know if you know that. Billy came to me to New Zealand. We went to Shine. I'm looking know. for a wetter in a cave. <laughs> and unfortunately, bit Billy on the thing. <laughs> show. Um, but I'm currently developing another nature show, which is probably about 18 months away from getting done. But guaranteed, if I do that nature show, Billy will again be invited. Right. 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 Everyone, like, subscribe to the Facebook on YouTube. Yes, everyone, yeah. subscribe to the Facebook on YouTube. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. <laughs> Here's some money, go see a Star Wars.